So welcome back to Let's Talk uh, Europe episode. And uh, today we have a special guest from Ukraine, an international expert on contemporary Ukrainian and post-communist politics, uh, nationalism, and uh, all things Ukrainian, uh, Taras Kuzio, who is a um, professor. So it's going to be a great time, and I'm pretty sure we're going we're gonna to find out uh, lots of stuff that, uh, you know, is not so easy to understand, uh, especially if um, a listener is further from Ukraine. And uh, it's really interesting when people from the Americas say hi in the Let's Talk Europe uh, episode. And uh, Ukraine is sometimes and part of the uh, US. Uh, it's um, a word which doesn't associate with uh, something good. And I mean here, you know, the, uh, the, the Trump and the Biden, uh, you know, all those political things that happened before the, before the war. But anyway, the most important thing that we have to understand this uh, and we have to debate today is uh, Ukrainian inside the um, structure, because uh, there is a myth, or, or maybe it's not, uh, Taras is going to clarify that, that Ukraine, uh, Ukraine is uh, divided and there is some part which is uh, pro-Russian and they really uh, want to join Russia and get back to the Soviet times, which is, of course, ridiculous, but uh, we're going to find an uh, scientific explanation. So, hello, Taras. Hello. Oh, hi. Good yeah, morning. So, so maybe yeah. I want to start from uh, something, you know, um, like, uh, you know, there, 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 is a, there is a thesis or a, a, hypo a hypothesis that um, this war in Ukraine, it, it's not actually about Ukraine, it's about uh, Europe. And uh, if, uh, if Russia wins this, um, then, you know, this... Uh, sort of nation state uh, ide ideals that, you know, uh, can blossom in the European Union, they will be maybe not destroyed, but this integration process uh, might begin. So it's, it's quite important to, to understand if, uh, if it's uh, worth fighting for Ukraine, if uh, the country has, you know, an ambition and, uh, you know, everything else to, to, to be a proper, you know, independent state uh, with uh, you know, values and uh, goals uh, of Western world. So can you clarify what is the, what is the situation in, in Ukraine and you know, the, the, the civic society and uh, uh, what are you know, the, the, the group, main groups that you know, are like, against it, if there are such? Because we, you know, before we heard about uh, the original party and you know the oligarchs that uh, sort of uh, supported this party and which was kind of destructive so what is the situation uh, since 2013 how it has changed and uh, how does ukraine you know politically look right now there is no question that uh, the kremlin see the war in ukraine as a war as a proxy war against the west put they don't even hide this. Um, I mean, you can read any of the Russian leaders, uh, Medvedev, Putin, uh, press secretary in the Kremlin, they all say the same thing. And the reason is, is that um, they really do believe in the Kremlin that Ukraine is a US puppet state. Um, they believe that uh, uh, the so-called little Russians, you know, this Little Russians, White Russians, and Great Russians all belong to one Pan-Russian people, the so-called Obshirutsky Narod. Uh, the Little Russians want to join the Russian world, but they are prevented from doing so by these Ukrainian nationalists and by uh, who are puppets of the West. This is this is what they believe in Moscow. Of course, this is nothing to do with reality, but this is was the basis for the um, uh, for the invasion on the twenty fourth of February. And they really did believe that they would be welcomed by little Russians holding flowers. Instead, these Ukrainians were holding javelins and stingers. So um, that's what they believe. They believe that, um, that nationalists came to power in the Euromaidan revolution in 2014, and that they have basically sold out their country to the West. Now, this has deep Soviet and KGB thinking behind it, because in the Soviet Union, um, the KGB and the Communist Party always believed and always used in their propaganda that dissidents and nationalists were never authentic local people. They were always puppets and agents of the CIA, of you know, Mossad, of MI6. So this is a continuation of the same kind of thinking and, and this legislation in Russia that 
if you're a think tank or an NGO or, a, or an independent media outlet, then you have to declare yourself to be a foreign agent. So it's the same kind of KGB thinking. Um, of, and it is, I think, true. And I think this viewpoint is quite widespread in the West now, um, that if Ukraine is defeated, then what do you have? You have a second Belarus uh, on, on, the, on the EU and NATO border, a second Belarus, which is four to five times bigger in population than Lukashenko's Belarus, which means four to five times more problems. Um, and Putin will not stop. Putin's a bully. He will only stop if he is stopped militarily. Um, I think that viewpoint is now finally accepted. It's taken too long for the West to reach this viewpoint. You know, why did it have to wait so long? If any of your um, people who were watching this were to find on the internet Putin's speech in February 2007, so 15 years ago, he gave a speech to the Munich Security Conference where he said the West and Russia are basically at war. He already said it then, but the West kept ignoring this. And Russia kept attacking the West, you know, with, with cyber warfare, with assassinations, with uh, interference in elections, like in the US in 2016, interference in referendums, like in Britain, in Scotland, in Catalonia, in Spain. So Russia was acting as though it was at war. The West was saying, no, 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 we're not at war. We want to continue doing business. We want to kind of normalize relations. So there was never any illusion in Moscow that there was a war situation. But unfortunately, the West has only finally woken up to this in 2022, when it should have woken up to this in 2014. Russia, or the Kremlin, shall we say, um, completely miscalculated because of the West. It miscalculated when it invaded in, 2000, in, in February because it believed that the West would again be weak in its response like it was in 2014. I mean, the West was completely weak. It didn't do anything in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia. There were no sanctions. And the EU blamed Georgia, blamed Saakashvili, the Georgian president for, for the conflict, didn't blame Russia. Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, who negotiated um, a ceasefire, was disgusting, and he he basically, you know, pinned all the blame on the Georgians. So well, you know, Georgia... in in the eastern part of uh, Europe, uh, we say that uh, it was you know Merkel who was uh, basically yes. the, the biggest problem in Europe uh, for stopping well, Russia. Sure, sure, it was the French and Germans always, but um, but. Um, uh, after Georgia, no sanctions. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton tried to do a reset of relations with Russia. Then in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea and, and invaded East Ukraine. The sanctions were weak. Business continued. Uh, Germany continued to build Nord Stream 2. Um, there were no real heavy repercussions for Russia. It was very weak. As, as some one expert told me, it was basically sanctions like three out of 10. It was not Iranian style sanctions, which are eight, nine out of 10. Um, although, so Russia believed again, the Kremlin believed that if it invaded um, Ukraine, that the same response would happen. The West would be weak, the West would be divided and Russia could get away with it. The Kremlin miscalculated. It miscalculated both in Western reaction, which the West was completely stunned, you know, Nord Stream 2 was closed down. You know, Russia could have waited six months and Nord Stream 2 was already up, would have been already operating. It didn't because it never believed that Germany would close Nord Stream 2. And um, it also miscalculated about Ukrainians. It never believed Ukrainians would fight and it believed Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, would, would run away from Ukraine. So R Putin, Putin's invasion was always premised on bad, bad intelligence. And the reason for that is that, in many ways, quite simple, is that um, I do not know of any experts, think tank, government, or academics in, in Moscow, in Russia, who understand Ukraine. They don't exist. I often joke in, in my lectures that there are more experts on Ukraine in Poland, probably in Lithuania. Uh, I know less, but probably in Lithuania. 
in Britain, in the US, in Canada, in Russia, there are no experts in Ukraine. Because if you have stereotypes and mythology about a country, you don't understand that country. You don't understand how this works. And this goes to your back to your question about uh, the regional kind of um, diversity of Ukraine. Nobody in Russia understands the concept of Russian speaking patriotism in Ukraine, nobody. Um, and they don't understand it because they assume that if you're a Ruski Yazichny, if you're a Russian speaker, then you should be automatically pro-Putin and pro-Russian world. They obviously have never heard of Austria and Germany, that you can be a German <laughs> speaker in Austria and be, you know, a, a, an Austrian patriot. I lived in Canada for 15 years. You know, most of Canada speaks English, but they're Canadians, they're not Americans. And throughout Latin America and Central America, most countries except Brazil, or all countries except Brazil speak Spanish, but they're all different countries, right? You know, you're a Colombian patriot or you're an Argentinian patriot. You're not um, a Spanish speaking patriot. So they, they have very 19th century definitions of, of what this nationalism should be. And they never have understood, and they still do not understand even now, um, how um, majority of Ukraine's Russian speakers, I mean, at least 90% um, supported Ukraine. So the war, this war in the Donbass, in, in southern Ukraine in 2014 and in Crimea, this conflict is not about language. It's not about Ukrainian versus Russian speakers. It's about civilization. What is your allegiance? Is your allegiance to, you know, are you nostalgic for the former Soviet Union? Are you pro Eurasian? Are you pro Ruski Mil, the Russian world? Or do you have an identity which is civic Ukrainian? You're part of Ukrainian culture, language, even though you might be a Russian speaker, it doesn't matter. And you see your country as as having a right to an independent foreign policy and, and where that country should go. So that is the difference in the two groups. And so most, what happened in 2014 was that Putin's project of so-called creation of a new Russia, he re revived this Tsarist term for Southern Eastern Ukraine, but of course Putin's history is very bad. So he included Kharkiv, which was never part of new Russia. Um, and the 2014 project done by Russia failed, completely failed. Um, they had tried to basically buy local pro-Russian activists to, to attack uh, government buildings, take them over, declare that they were in de declaring independence from Kiev and supporting annexation to Russia but they couldn't find any pro-Russian support in any of that region except in the Donbass. And the reason is there was never really an East-West split. What it was was that in the East or in the Southeast, um, the Donbass and Crimea were quite unique. But that's similar as well in West Ukraine, Galicia is unique as well. I mean, you have these very re unique regions. Um, the whole of West Ukraine is not the same as Galicia, um, and, and the whole of East Ukraine is not the same as the Donbass. Um, so in the Donbass, um, there was always about one third of the population, which was very nostalgic for the Soviet Union and supported some kind of separatism, but only one third, remember. In the Crimea, this was about 40%. So none of these two regions had majority support of more than 50% for separatism. But it doesn't matter if you have a very aggressive 35, 40% uh, minority, a very aggressive minority, which is supported by Russian military forces, then you can come to power, particularly because Ukrainians living in the Donbass and Crimea are, were, were not very active. They were quite relatively passive. They were, you know, they had been Russified and subdued for many years. So that is what happened in, in 2014. Russia was only able to successfully occupy about 40% of the Donbass and then occupy Crimea. Um, 
Now, so the project to you kind of use intelligence services to create some kind of pro-Russian uprisings failed. So Russia had to resort to full-scale invasion. Um, Aras, in here, I, I, here I want to ask a clarification. Right. Because there is one more hypothesis that um, I even heard from a few Ukrainians uh, who are uh, journalists that uh, basically this um, uh, understanding of Ukraine is uh, generational. That people that are born after 90s, well, they, they have uh, learned that schools are uh, proper history, I mean, uh, actual history, and uh, they have, you know, understanding of what is Ukrainian culture, what was it, you know, uh, through the centuries, uh, and uh, people who are, well, born before the 90s, uh, and I'm talking, you know, way before the 90s, uh, they have, the, you know, been fed and bred, you know, this uh, Soviet-style propaganda, and uh, they have this, uh, well, uh, nostalgia or delusion, I'm not sure how to call, but, uh, you know, they have an approach that uh, Ukraine is uh, part of, you know, this Soviet project. How do you see it as a historian? Um, I, I, I kind of disagree with that. The problem with, with this kind of approach is that um, for the last 30 years, I keep hearing that the younger generation is more democratic, more liberal, more this. In Russia, for example, the, the younger generation is actually very nationalistic and very pro-Stalin. Um, they, they, have, they have supported the, the revival and rehabilitation of Stalin. So we have to be careful about this generation. Yes, it's true, of course, that um, the, the generations born from, I would say from the late second half of the eighties onwards, they've gone to Ukrainian schools, they've been taught Ukraine history, um, and they've experienced different things. So they've traveled to Europe, um, they don't have, their heads are not as zombified as, as people who lived in the Soviet Union. But we have to be cautious because, for example, um, if we're talking about generations, in West Ukraine, the older generation was never pro-Soviet. The older generation in West Ukraine joined the partisan, nationalist partisans, and fought against the Soviet Union until the early 1950s. So, you know, the two biggest anti-Soviet partisan movements um, were Lithuanians and Ukrainians. But here, here, here I'm talking about the ones that are born between 60s and 80s, let's put it roughly, that they are well, proper, you know, Soviet uh, people. Yeah, I, I still, I think that we have to be cautious. Um, it's, it's a very mixed picture. The, the greatest amount of nostalgia for the Soviet Union in Ukraine was always, yes, it was about amongst uh, pensioners, um, the older generation, uh, particularly in East Ukraine, but the, but the only place in Ukraine where uh, local people had, um, uh, they even said we, we, we think we are Soviet by nationality, was in Crimea and Donbass. That was the only two places. Um, and and, and that, that expression of nostalgia for the Soviet Union was then reflected in support for separatism. So amongst that 35% in the Donbass and 40% in Crimea who supported separatism. I'm sure most of those people were nostalgic for the Soviet Union and they were older generation people. Um, but um, I saw, you know, I'm looking at the opinion polls since the invasion. Um, the one of the major differences between Russia and Ukraine is that in U Russia, nostalgia for the Soviet Union keeps growing higher and higher and higher. In Ukraine, it keeps collapsing. So the latest opinion poll now is that only 11% of Ukrainians have nostalgia for the Soviet Union, which is very low. Um, and, and I'm sure you know, 95% of those are over 65, 70 years old. Um, so, um, and this was the problem of the, going back to your question about pro-Russian parties. Um, well, your party of regions was this political machine, but it disintegrated in 2014. Um, because of the murders of protesters on, on the Euromaidan. Um, the successor party was the opposition bloc and then the opposition platform. But these two parties were very small um, and they, uh, their voters were, were mainly pensioners in East Ukraine. Now, pensioners never use social media. Um, pensioners um, tend to get their information from television most of the time. 
and they're not active. They don't join civil society groups. So the problem that these pro-Russian parties had was that their voters were very passive. They were not very active. Um, now, what's, uh, and the other interesting factor here is that 2014, because of Russia occupying Ukrainian territory in East, in the Donbass and in Crimea, 16% of Ukrainian voters were outside of Ukraine. Um, and these voters were precisely those pro-Russian voters from earlier elections. So Russian military action actually helped to reduce the impact or the influence of pro-Russian voters. Um, and, um, and so these, these, these successor parties, opposition bloc, opposition platform to the party regions could never win a parliamentary election and they could never win a presidential election. So what changed in 2014 was that presidential elections were no longer in the second round, a contest between, between, I have to stop. Yeah, yeah no problem. Um, they could not, um, they um, could not be elected to parliament, they could not get a majority in parliament or, or president. For example, opposition bloc had maybe 40 deputies out of 420. Um, and previously, prior to 2014, usually in the second round of presidential elections, there was a contest between a candidate who was pro-Russian, the candidate who was pro-Western. So like Yanukovych Yushchenko or Yanukovych Tymoshenko. That completely stopped in 2014 because pro-Russian uh, parties could not get to the second round anymore, their candidate. Um, which meant that um, sort of the, the political configuration completely changed in the country. It meant that um, the only kind of uh, parties with strong support or with um, political leaders with strong support were pro-Western. If you looked at the top five political forces in the Ukrainian parliament, the pro-Russian opposition bloc was like number four or five. Um, so, Taras, um, I, think, I, I think here it's a good uh, place to ask one, uh, one question, which is also um, quite... Uh, Absurd, uh, you know, absurd like when you look from my perspective from, you know, Eastern Europe, but in the in, in United States, uh, uh, some Republican, um, you say, uh, let's say, um, uh, L voters or, you know, the, the people who are sympathize uh, to Republicans, they say that during the war, I mean, right now, uh, uh, the parliament of Ukraine kind of suppressed uh, those um, pro-Soviet movements, and they call it, uh, you know, and they question Ukrainian democracy and uh, um, political view, you know, freedom and, and freedom of speech. What do you think about uh, about this issue? Is it actually, uh, can, it, can it be, you know, can such question be raised in, 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 in the situation of war that you, you are not allowed to uh, suppress, you know, some kind of uh, enemy inside in, 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 within the country? Well, there are, there are two issues here. Um, after 2014, the Communist Party of Ukraine was um, de facto banned. And it was banned because, because it refused to remove its Soviet communist symbols. Uh, the decommunization laws adopted in 2014 in Ukraine banned the spreading of Nazi and communist symbols. So any political force that um, had a Nazi or communist symbols were, were removed. What Ukraine did was uh, join uh, countries of primarily of Eastern Europe, like the Baltic states, uh, to say that these are two evil totalitarian ideologies and they are both equally horrible, both equally criminal, um, which is not always a view you get in the West, by the way. I Absolutely. Know, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of left-wing academics in the West refuse to accept that Com communism is, is, is equally evil as Nazism. So this was the reason. So the Communist Party was banned. Now, rem let's remember that in quite a few countries in Europe, the fascist and Nazi parties are banned, in, like, for example, in Germany. So there's no problem. I, don't see, I see no problem in banning the equivalent of the fascist Nazi party in Ukraine, the Communist Party. 
Um, this is a party that refuses to accept, you know, that it did anything illegal in the past. This is the hard core of the old Soviet Communist Party. So that was the Communist Party that, that stopped really being able to participate in elections from about 2015. Since the invasion, you've had the banning of about uh, 10 or 11 pro-Russian parties. Now, this is more to do with the war. And this is to do with the fact that many of its members in, in the regions became collaborators with Russian occupation forces. Now, it's simply ridiculous to believe that in any democracy that these parties would be allowed to exist in a war situation. Um, Americans and others have very short memories because in World War II, United States interned over 100,000 Japanese citizens of America um, when they, because they were at war with Japan. They put in concentration camps in the United States. In Canada, they put uh, the same number of Ukrainians in World War I in concentration camps because Canada was at war with Austria-Hungary. So um, in a war situation, everything changes. Um, the, these these um, political parties um, are, the, are their own fault. You know, many of their members are collaborating. When I was in Kiev in early May, I interviewed the uh, former leader of the opposition platform, Yuri Boyko. Um, and he, he's from Luhansk originally. He actually showed me a photograph of his apartment in Luhansk, which had been destroyed by Russian forces. Um, and I asked him, are there any pro-Russian forces left in Ukraine? He said, no, Russia has destroyed them. So um, in, when the invasion happened, this is his view, when the invasion happened, pro-Russian groups like his had to choose, are you with Ukraine or are we with Russia? And he, and he's, he, is, a, he is a supporter of Ukraine. So, and there are, there are many examples of this. Uh, the head of the Krivirich, um, which is very close to Russian occupied Zaporizhia, Krivirik region is a former, is a guy called Alexander Vilkul, who is a former member, leading member of the opposition um, bloc. He is now a Ukrainian patriot, you know, so I have no problem with him. You know, if he's fighting for Ukraine, sure. But there are others who are collaborators. So that's the reason these parties are, are banned and they would be banned in any other country in Europe or United States um, in a war situation. It's purely because of this. And um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that's necessarily a good, a good argument. Um, but just, just a quick sort of important for your members to understand what happened after 2014, which I wrote about that you said you read, that the Ukrainian so-called Southeast, this Russian speaking Southeast, um, completely disintegrated after 2014. So um, scholars from like Kharkiv and other and places like this said that basically the East no longer exists, you know, a unified East. Um, and this is eight regions of, of the South and East. What you had was about, um, I would say you could talk about it divided into like three groups. Um, the, the largest was four, four regions, particularly Kherson, Dnipropetrovsk, Mikolaev, Zaporizhia, um, which, were, which became totally pro-Ukrainian and kind of their identity became central Ukrainian. Dnipropetrovsk was incredibly fascinating because it's not only um, an important city in the Soviet Union, this was the center of the Soviet nuclear weapons industry in the Soviet Union. Um, it, was, it was also um, a place which had a, the biggest Jewish revival in Europe since 1991. And it was a major Jewish center. Um, and um, Ukraine's Jews, most of whom are Russian speakers, um, were 100% pro-Ukrainian. Why? Jews have no nostalgia for the Soviet Union. <laughs> um, well, yeah, you know, anybody were, who knows history understands why. Yeah, because they, their culture was repressed, their religion was destroyed, um, and their culture and religion has been, been supported in its revival in, in, in a free Ukraine. So for those four regions, the other next two regions would be Kharkiv and Odessa, which, which were less kind of, um, I would say, didn't move as much in terms of our identity, but still changed. Um, and then you had Donbass, the two regions of Donbass, Donetsk, Luhansk. 
So pro-Russian forces like this opposition bloc, um, previously they could get support in all of these eight regions, but after 2014, only in the Donbas, only in these, in these two regions. Um, and what we have seen now in, since the invasion has proven this because Ukrainian forces are strongly fighting Russia in Kharkiv. Kharkiv is 40, 40 kilometers from the Russian border. And yet Ukraine, Ukrainian uh, troops and local territorial defense force from Kharkiv are fighting Russia very good there. Uh, Taras, you know, I, Taras, I want to ask you one more thing Russia. right here. Because uh, in this um, in this book that um, you mentioned to me before our interview, and uh, I'll put the link into the description, anybody can uh, read it. It's, it's a great material, uh, lots of data. But there's one thing that uh, caught my attention, uh, and I want to clarify on that. There was a, a report uh, which is mentioned in your article uh, about the vulnerability to, to Russian propaganda and. Uh, well, the sad story is that Kherson uh, has been mentioned as the, the one with the lowest level of vulnerability. And uh, we know what happened to Kherson, Kherson region in this uh, latest episode of, of war since uh, February 24. What is the case uh, with Kherson? Uh, traitors, uh, collaborators, what, what happened there? Because uh, it had to be a, some kind of a bastion of, you know, a very pro-Ukrainian force, and uh, it, it fell. Yeah, good question, because Kherson, um, in this southeast region, Kherson was the most pro-Ukrainian in many ways, because it was a, um, a, a, a largely agricultural region. It kind of extends northern Crimea is similar to, to Kherson. It's basically steppe land, agricultural, small towns, and on the whole, Ukrainian people. Um, so um, it, it was surprising to me. And the only the only explanation you, I can think of is is yes, treason um, from local, um, probably local officials and local security service people. That's there's no other reason I can think of that why this why this took place. And the fault for this uh, can be blamed on I think President Zelensky. I mean, you know, he he is the one who installs the leader of the Ukrainian security service and the regional leaders of Ukrainian security service. Um, I'm not a military expert, but I know that the two areas where Ukraine failed in the beginning of the invasion was uh, to stop Russian troops coming from Crimea when it was obvious that they were going to do this and to stop Russian troops coming from Belarus to Kiev. To me, this was kind of a bit strange that this wasn't seen as a priority, but, um, uh, and Kherson now is, um, is a potential, well, not a potential problem, but certainly somewhere which has to be liberated. Kiev has been liberated, but, um, but Kherson. So yes, it, it, the, the, you can only explain this by, not by pro-Russian sentiment, but only by treason. So you mean in general, we don't have uh, such a area or or you maybe it, it was never there i'm talking about this new russia and, and this claim to to you know basically that the population there is waiting for 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 the russians to come and liberate and we saw what, what actually happened uh, so we can basically forget about this new russia project or or still there is some kind of uh, as you say in in those in the donbas uh, region it, it's still it, it's still actually uh, some kind of, you know, alive and uh, and maybe, you know, could, 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 could uh, lead uh, forward uh, that, you know, if even the territory is liberated, uh, there will be problems there. No, the, the, you, the new Russia so-called project has two components. Uh, one component is this Russian imperial nationalist most, um, kind of rhetoric and discourse. Um, which has been revived by Putin in 2014, that, um, that this region of Ukraine was wrongly included by Lenin, the first Soviet leader inside Ukraine. This was, as Putin calls it, ancient Russian land, and it should never have been part of Ukraine. So this is, this is the argument that Putin has been making for the last eight years, um, which has been ignored by the West wrongly. Um, and he, so that's the kind of ideological argument. 
Um, and um, the other argument is more um, important in some ways, and that is to ensure that Russia controls southern Ukraine to prevent Ukraine from having access to the Black Sea. Um, because then that destroys the Ukrainian economy. And so that, that more strategic and geopolitical, I think, argument is, is in some ways more important than the ideological. But of course, Putin uses both. Um, the problem that Putin's had is that his invasion has not been very successful. He's only captured one oblast, one you know, regional center, Kherson, nowhere else has he captured. Um, because Donetsk and Luhansk were already controlled by Russia prior to the invasion. So it's not a great success story. And we will see what happens in Kherson. Um, of course, Ukraine is planning uh, some kind of offensive. Um, unfortunate for Russia is that Kherson is on the, um, it is called the right bank of the Dnipro River. So if you look at it on the map, it's on the left side of the Dnipro River which makes it more difficult to protect on the part of Russia. And so it's going to be, I think, I think Ukrainians will liberate Kherson. Um, and this is why Ukraine is preparing now doing this by destroying um, about 15 Russian ammunition dumps, by destroying four Russian uh, train convoys with ammunition and, and damaging three bridges that go from, uh, the, the right side of Dnipro River to the city of Kherson. So, so the troops in Kherson now are isolated, Russian troops. Um, and the reason why the airfield uh, was attacked yesterday in Crimea, there's no question the it was a, you know, it was a, it was either, you, we, what we don't know, was it a Ukrainian Neptune missile or was it one of these long distance missiles just given by the United States a few weeks ago. Um, because um, the United States was very cautious about giving Ukraine these long distance missiles because it didn't want Ukraine to fire them into Russia. But the United States is okay with Ukraine firing them into Crimea because Crimea is internationally recognized as Ukrainian territory. But according to Reports: um, Nine Russian fighter jets were destroyed at this airfield yesterday. I I, I think that you know what I read from in, in the morning and today is uh, uh, the tenth of August. Uh, it's up to forty aircrafts, including helicopters well, and, and fighter planes. Well, so, Slava okay. Ukraine. <laughs> yes, Herohem Slava for sure. Um, so and the reason why this was attacked is again and not so complicated. Is because if Ukraine launched an offensive on Kherson. Russia would have been sending airplanes from Crimea to support its troops. So Russia cannot do that anymore. I mean, there are still four more. There are five military airfields in Crimea and, of course, the Kerch Bridge as well, which are strategic tar targets. But, um, but um, you know, th this kind of uh, military attacks can only be undertaken with the support of Western countries. There's, I, you know, Western intelligence um, is very important in this, and the New York Times has written about this and elsewhere. So, um, this 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 kind of activity is a is a joint, but of course secret operation um, conducted by uh, Ukraine with the help of its Western partners. So, Taras, uh, j just to get back to this, um, you know, um, state uh, so so called state problem uh, in Ukraine. So. Uh, as you explained, uh, you know, the regions uh, and this uh, new Russia project is uh, actually uh, not a project anymore. Uh, are there any other, I don't know, civil problems between the regions and uh, or, you know, the minorities that are living there? Because, for example, you know, maybe uh, American listeners don't even know about this. Uh, uh, Hungary President uh, Viktor Orban has complained that uh, you know the uh, uh, Hungarian minority living in in, in Ukraine uh, is in danger, and uh, you know that there are other ethnic minorities. Uh, but like in, in general, what is the situation? What kind of uh, statehood, um, well, let's say, status is is at the moment? And um, 
what is the glue that is keeping this this country you know as an independent uh, nation state uh, which is willing to to join the into uh, you know the international and european uh, you know institutions well um we i i always grew up as an anti-communist but we should recognize that a kind of uh, combined identity was also developed in even in the soviet union um the 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 fact that you had all these people living inside Ukraine's borders, inside the Soviet Union, um, did create an, a, an identity, an attachment to this territory and to these borders. Um, what your uh, viewers probably don't know is that Ukraine was a founding member of the United Nations. In 1945, Stalin demanded three seats at the United Nations for USSR, which is of course for Russia, for Ukraine and Belarus. So USSR had three seats. One of them was Ukraine. Ukraine has a small foreign policy elite. Um, so in 1991, Ukraine didn't come with nothing. You know, there was already some kind of combined identity. What you've seen in the last 30 years or since the late 1980s is the spreading of, um, I would say, a Ukrainian identity from West Ukraine to Central Ukraine and then to East Ukraine. Um, it spread to central Ukraine in the Orange Revolution of 2004, when Yushchenko won the elections with the support of central and western Ukraine. And then in the Euromaidan Revolution in 2014, and since with Russian military aggression, it spread to the east and south. So I don't see a problem with national integration. I mean, what's happening with the invasion is that um, uh, that national integration has gone completely sky high, you know, rocket high, because um, something like uh, 6 million, about 12 million Ukrainians were uh, dislocated and 5 million went abroad as refugees and about 6 million stayed in Ukraine as IDPs, internally displaced people. Most of those IDPs went to West Ukraine. So, this is a great opportunity for East Ukrainians and West Ukrainians to mingle together. Now, this already began in 2014, like you, you find Crimean Tatars in Lviv, for example. Um, but this is now even more the case. Um, many businesses from like um, IT businesses from Kharkiv and elsewhere and Mariupol moved to Lviv, moved to Transcarpathia. So that national integration prop is not I think it was always exaggerated, but now it's simply a non-issue. And when you look at opinion polls today, there is simply no difference between the views of East Ukraine and West Ukrainians. For the first time ever now, majority of, a large majority of East Ukrainians support NATO membership. Thank you, Vladimir Putin. 89% um, of Ukrainians, which means also East Ukrainians, believe Russia is committing genocide in Ukraine. What this has done, is um, uh, led to a uh, shift towards people um, saying that they are ethnic Ukrainian. So this was already seen before in various uh, surveys done before the invasion, but now it's confirmed even more that 92% of the population of Ukraine say they are ethnic Ukrainian. And how, how, just for, for, for the clarification, how would you describe what is an ethnic uh, Ukrainian? Because, you know, it, it, it's it, probably it's easier in, in Poland, but in Ukraine, it's, it's a bit more uh, diverse. No, 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 it's, it, I don't think it's a problem. I mean, you are, you are basically asked, like, I mean, in, in a census or in an opinion poll, you are asked, what, how do you see your nationality or ethnic allegiance? And you have a list of, of allegiances, Hungarian, Polish, Jewish, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, Lithuanian, um, and 92% um, say they are Ukrainian. Only five, the, the key thing here is that um, the, there has been a collapse in Russian identity in Ukraine. In the 1989 Soviet census, um, there was about 22% of the population of Ukraine were ethnic Russians or called themselves ethnic Russians. Um, and this was a product like in Latvia and Estonia of 
the Soviet Union deliberately sending in Russians to live in these countries. And um, in uh, Ukraine has only held one census in 2001. This, this figure went from 22 to 17%. Now it's 5%. You always had in East Ukraine quite a large group of people who were kind of saw themselves, they didn't want to make a choice. They were kind of, they wanted to say they were both Russian Ukrainian because they had, for example, mixed parents. Um, that's completely changed in the last eight years and especially since the invasion. What is important to know here is that, um, you know, 92% Ukrainians, 5% Russians, that's 97. So oh, the minorities in Ukraine are very small. I mean, Hungarians are about 150,000. And but there's, there's very few Polish minority, very small Jewish minority um, and others. So 92%, do you know what this is? This, is the, this makes Ukraine the fourth largest uh, country in Europe with ethnic national homog homogeneity. Only about only three other countries in Europe have a higher figure for the titular nation in, in their population. I think it's the Czech Republic, maybe Italy and Poland. Every other country is lower than Ukraine. So Ukraine has a very high proportion of people. Now, of course, when you are when you say you're ethnic Ukrainian, you can be a Ukrainian speaker, you can be a Russian speaker, but most of those are probably bilingual speakers. Um, so they, they they can use both, or if they if they have to, but they certainly know both languages. What we've seen since the invasion is a switch to Ukrainian even more than before, um, because now. The Russian language is viewed as a language of the invasion. The language well, we heard Russia. that even in Kharkiv, which you mentioned, uh, and you mentioned, uh, you know, the sympathy that was before, you know, uh, they, they speak gone. they speak Ukrainian right now. It's gone. It's gone. Now, just on your question of where Ukraine would like to join, um, Ukraine has been wanting to join the NATO and the EU for a long time. Um, it's NATO since at least the mid 2000s and the EU as well. Um, the West here has been, um, and NATO in particular, has been very hypocritical. I think it's very um, double, strong double standards that, you know, when Finland and Sweden wanted to, said that they wanted to join NATO, NATO responded and said, yes, when would you like to join? Yesterday or today? Um, no problem. Um, Ukraine has been trying, Ukraine and Georgia have been trying to join NATO since at least 2008 and 2006. And NATO has been basically lying to them. Well, you know, the, the main argument since 2014 is, or 14, let's put it, uh, was the territorial uh, disputes with Russia and, you know, and not, not uh, it, it's not allowed for a NATO country. How, how do you... Yes, but, but there was no territorial dispute prior to 2014. In yeah. 2008, um, NATO turned down Georgia and Ukraine's request for, for membership. They said, yes, in the future, you will get a membership action plan, but gave no date. Um, and on the territorial question, we have to be very cautious. When Germany joined NATO in the 90, early 1950s, Germany was a country which where it was divided. Half of Germany was occupied by the Soviet Union. And yet Western Germany was allowed to join NATO. Eastern Germany was an occupied territory. So that didn't stop West Germany joining NATO. And also Cyprus was allowed to join the European Union, but Northern Cyprus is occupied by Turkey. So, Absolutely. Um, so uh, I think that um, the West has not been very honest uh, to Ukraine or NATO has not been very honest to Ukraine um, about, <coughs> about this membership question. and. Um, even though today um, Ukraine is fighting NATO's war uh, against Russia. Because so, Taras, Taras, defeated, Taras I, I want to hear some Ukraine clarifications. Defeated, the next country will be the Baltic states. Absolutely. So, we, we'll, we'll get back to this. But uh, why you, you said that, uh, you know, in Russia there are no Ukrainian experts. So, what is the problem with the West? You know, the Western Europe, with the United States, uh, and the experts of Ukraine. Uh, you know, why don't they see Ukraine as a 
independent uh, country who wants to join and has the capability and the willingness. And we saw the Euro Maidan, you know, and, and the people with the flags. Uh, what is the key issue here? Uh, I, I heard one interesting uh, explanation from, uh, well, let's call him uh, your colleague, uh, Timothy Snyder, who said that um, Europe does not expand into uh, the land, you know, that was the first round of Stalinism, basically, you know, the uh, who who became, you know, occupied from the 22, 1922, not, not after the Second World War. How, why do you see, in, in your opinion, is this problem? I, I, this is a very big subject. I mean, I think that um, uh, there are a number of uh, factors here. Firstly, you, in, the, in the West, I wouldn't say it's the same. I mean, there are many good experts um, in the West um, writing on Ukraine, particularly, especially in the field of political science. I think in the field of history, it's more complicated. Um, the most academic centers in Western countries, which deal with the former communist world, they now call things like Center for Russian Eurasian Studies or Center for Eastern European and Russian Studies, things like this. Um, the, these are usually centers where they are controlled or the guys in charge are usually experts on Russia. So they are the largest group. You know, there are far more experts in the West on Russia than they are on Poland and on Ukraine, for example. And because they control these centers, then they have a, a bit, lot of influence on, on, on what, is, what, what kind of subjects are being taught. And also, they also have a lot of influence on academic journals because they act as referees for articles submitted. And I've experienced this. So I think that's one problem. Um, they, 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 the, another thing which I would say is that many of them are quite lazy. They, uh, I call this academic uh, orientalism. They still now refuse to use Ukrainian sources. Um, so they, when they're writing about Ukraine, they only use Russian sources. Um, I mean, sources from Russia, not sources. which is ridiculous in terms of you know. Yes, of course it's ridiculous, especially because it's you're being completely lazy, because you can be sitting anywhere in the world and you can access Ukrainian sources as easy as Russian sources. And many, there are Russian language publications, and President Zelensky's website is in English, Russian, and Ukrainian. So there's no excuse. But people are lazy. You know, they're used to using only those sources. And, and this field of studies is also very, very unusual in that if you're a Russianist, if you are an expert on Russia, then you believe for some reason that you are also an expert on Ukraine. You're also an expert on the Baltic States. You're also an expert on Central Asia, which is ridiculous you, because you are not. You know, because they think still in Soviet categories that if I'm a Russian expert, you know, I'm an expert on the entire former Soviet Union. For example, if I was an expert on Brazil, that does not make me an expert on Latin America. Um, but, but they think it is, they think they are. And um, usually therefore the problem is, is that for media interviews or for podcasts, often these Russian experts are invited to comment about, you know, the uprising in Kazakhstan or the, or the Ukrainian war, not Ukrainian experts. Um, so, this has meant that um, they got it completely wrong in 2014, these Western experts, and they got it completely wrong now with the invasion. Um, it wasn't just the Kremlin that got the invasion wrong, it was Western experts on Russia, because they also believed, like the Kremlin, that Ukraine would, would be defeated in two days, three days. They also believed that, you know, Ukraine is a kind of, not a fake country, like Russia says, but a kind of a very regionally divided country. The East would never fight for Ukraine, would fight for, would support Russia, um, and that Ukraine would be quickly defeated because this mighty Russian army would, would easily conquer Ukraine. They were completely wrong. Why were they wrong? Because they know, they know nothing about Ukraine. They claim they do, but they don't read Ukrainian publications. They never travel to Ukraine to do research. And they don't, you know, talk to experts in Ukraine. But Taras, I, I want to ask, uh, like, uh, additional, like, uh, or put on the table additional uh, hypothesis here, because, uh, let's say, in Poland, uh, analysts and experts say that uh, 
Western Europe is afraid of new power concentration in 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 the eastern part or central east part of of Europe, uh, which would be a problem for Paris Berlin axis, and this new axis could be you know Warsaw Kiev. Uh, is that a factor, you know, in the, all this laziness and double standards, as, as, as you said, of, you know, uh, promises to, to Ukraine? I don't think so. I think that's been taken, becoming a bit too conspiracy theory, I think. Um, I think that, um, I think the problems are just this deep, uh, is, you know, this kind of domination by Russian experts, and I say it, particularly in, in the field of history, because, um, Western historians of Russia just basically use imperial Russian narratives to attach Ukraine as a kind of subsidiary to Russian history. Um, now, of course, there is competition to these kind of ideas from Western centers on Ukraine, like the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute or the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies. There is alternatives. Serhei Plochy at the Harvard Ukrainian Institute um, is very active in publishing books and his history of Ukraine has been seen, you know, been quite, been spread quite, quite widely. So I don't think it's so much that. You have um, a mixture of this very deep tradition of Russophiles, particularly in Germany. Germany, you can't find hardly any Ukrainian experts. It's all completely dominated by Russian experts uh, in Germany. Similar to, similarly in France as well, very few. So I think it's partly this Russof old style Russophilism in academia. And also you have, um, and, I, and I wrote about this in, in 2014, you have also a lot of useful idiots. Um, you have these, um, uh, particularly on the extreme left um, in the West, and you have a lot of academics who are on the extreme left, who, who basically just use Kremlin propaganda. They just repeat it um, in their publications. Um, in Britain, you have Richard Sakwa, who does this. Um, he's very close to the former leader of the British Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, so the same kind. Oh, of... yes, we heard Corbyn's, uh, you know, thoughts yes. about Ukraine just a yes. week ago, yes. you know, uh, well, not Richard only Sackler his. Is, yes, Richard Sakwa is the academic equivalent of this. Um, so, you know, America is bad, Russia is better. Um, so um, you have that. In America, you have Stephen Cohen. Um, very famous historian of Russia, but who, who also just repeated Kremlin propaganda. So you have, it's a mixture of things. And for those kind of useful idiots, extreme left-wing useful idiots, they always blamed the West for the crisis in 2014. It was NATO's fault. It was never Russia's fault. Um, Russia was pushed, you know, Russia was forced to react as it were. Um, now, uh, they they are just, I say, they, they just, propagate Russian disinformation and, and Russian propaganda about Ukraine and, and about the, so for example, they would call the war in Ukraine a civil war, not, which is complete, completely wrong. There was never a civil war in Ukraine. This was a Russian military aggression. But they, they now since the invasion, these useful idiots have been very quiet. <laughs> because what can they say now? I mean, Russia is committing genocide. I mean, this is now an um, accepted view. The Russian state is now described by quite a few experts in the West as a fascist state, totalitarian dictatorship and a fascist state. Um, in 2016, I was editing a special issue of a, of a journal, Communist and Post-Communist Studies, about Russia, about Putin's Russia. And Alexander Mottl, a very well-known academic in the United States, wrote an article saying Putin's Russia is a fascist state. The, the, the reviewers didn't like it. Well, guess what? Today, everybody thinks this now. <laughs> so six years later, this is now a majority viewpoint. So um, I think that what's changed between 2014 and 2022, in 2014, these useful idiots were saying a lot of these ridiculous things like it's all NATO's fault, America's fault, you know, repeating Russian propaganda. Today, they don't really have any arguments. Now, now they are being very quiet. Um, and now the majority viewpoints in the West are Russia is committing genocide, Russia is a fascist di a dictatorship, and Putin is completely wrong to invade Ukraine. And what changed, um, what changed 
in, in Western viewpoints was Russia's, um, was Putin's long essay published in July of last year, where he basically, Putin's long essay from July of 2021 is Putin's Mein Kampf. This is his ideological um, thesis for why he invaded Ukraine in February of this year. So if your viewers want to understand why he invaded, they have to just to look at Putin's essay from July of last year. This is his Mein Kampf, where he wrote that Ukraine is a fake country. There is no such country. Ukrainians are a branch of the Russian people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and this was a product of uh, about 15 years of the rehabilitation of this white Russian emigre views um, and the, the bringing back to Russia of these white Russian emigre writings and the reburial of white Russian emigres writers and, um, and uh, military leaders like Denikin, like Ivan Ilyin. Putin's favorite author is Ivan Ilyin, who was a fascist in interwar Europe. He was the fascist, anti-Semite, and Ukrainian folk. And this is Putin's favorite author that he has instructed Russian children in schools and Russian soldiers to, to read. So, um, I, so I think what, what changed in the Western perception was, the, was coming to understand about this Russian imperial nationalism and, and why this conflict between Russia and Ukraine was nothing to do with NATO enlargement, but all to do with Russian imperial nationalism and chauvinism and the denial of Ukraine's right to exist and the existence of Ukrainian people. So, Tara, so I want I want to uh, because I see that you know uh, we are taking uh, quite a lot of time and it it might be you know over what I asked you. So I I want to like um, kind of summarize this and uh, ask you a very important question like uh, because uh, the winter is coming and you know obviously it's going to be a lot of political pressure uh, on on Europe on, on on your mentioned Germany and you know the the rest uh, in in terms of uh, kind of uh, sit down do some kind of Minsk free agreement uh, sacrifice Ukrainian territory or or, or something else but uh, like Ukraine as a buffer state for Europe how you know what kind of danger would be leaving this conflict at at such stage uh, uh, you know, like you mentioned that uh, Putin is a bully and you have to knock him down, you know, knock his teeth out uh, on the only way he understands. But uh, like in more uh, historian, politi political, political scientist uh, terms, uh, what can be done here so we don't have this uh, buffer problem that Euro Ukraine is uh, integrated into Europe, you know, and uh, the Western world, uh, maybe even NATO. So everything is kind of settled. Uh, what is your view here? Um, well, I think, I think in the West, you have really um, two approaches to the war. You have one approach, which is probably dominating in, um, in the former communist world in Central Eastern Europe and the Baltic states, um, is that Putin needs to be defeated. And, and, you, and that's understandable because uh, if you are living in those countries, you understand that if Putin is not defeated in Ukraine, he will go to their countries next. So that is one viewpoint. Putin needs to be defeated and Ukraine should be given everything it needs to defeat Putin. The second viewpoint I think is more maybe France and Germany, shall we say, which is that Putin needs to be weakened so much that he is forced to negotiate. Um, and, um, you know, he comes to the negotiating table as a weakened uh, person. I, I don't believe in this position. I don't believe it because I think it doesn't quite understand Putin's mentality and the mentality of the people in the Kremlin. Um, Putin does not understand compromise. In Ukraine, we understand, we know this from the last eight years. Uh, the KGB and Russian imperial mentality is that we, you either um, are, you either, you need to be defeated, you need to be subjugated, you need to put your hands in the air and surrender, that we don't do compromises. Compromise is a dirty Anglo-Saxon word I remember reading from one former KGB officer. So I don't think Putin is going to ever agree to that. 
where the big game changer will happen will be um, in southern Ukraine, not in the Donbas, in southern Ukraine. If Ukraine um, successfully uh, does an offensive and takes back Kherson, I don't know if Putin can survive. Um, can, can he survive such a defeat? Because you can't hide this defeat from the Russian people and from your allies. So I think that if Ukraine is successful in southern Ukraine, um, then, then it's a problem for Putin whether he can survive as a leader. Of course, he thinks he will be president for life. He changed the constitution to make him basically president for life. But I'm not sure that's going to be possible if Russia is very badly defeated in the south. Because if Kherson is retaken, then Putin's entire strategy for so-called new Russia begins to, begins to disintegrate. Um, so I, I think we, we will see. Um, of course, there is a time, the two time constraints are both winter, which is from say November, and also um, Russian threats to hold referendums on annexation of these territories. Um, and so there is a time, time pressure, but um, uh, the West so far is being, success, being you know, willing to give weapons, including even Germany. I've seen videos of German weapons being used in the Donbass. Um, as a Russian TV commentator said, this is the first time since World War II. <laughs> um, and, um, um, but um, I think the other, the other area that um, is, you know, we have to see what happens is the Ukrainian economy because the West, Ukraine needs financial support to keep its economy going during this war situation. So it's not just a question of military support, it's also economic financial support. But regarding I, the support, like we know that in the States, there's gonna be a change in political uh, uh, yeah. seating, you know, uh, would that, would that how do you think? Uh, is it possible that something is going to change in the states regarding the, you know, finances uh, to Ukraine? We we simply don't know because, um, for all we know, by 2024, Donald Trump could be in jail. We simply don't know. Um, so we don't know to what degree um, the Republican Party, you know, who will be the candidate, um, who will who will win. I think that. Um, I personally think from current evidence that there is quite a strong anti-Putin uh, sentiments in throughout Washington. I mean, the U.S. Senate, which has um, which has a large number of Republican um, senators. Well, it's 50-50, um, something like that at the moment. Yeah, it's about half and half. I mean, it's, it's very tough on Russia. I mean, the U.S. Senate voted a week ago to demand that the US State Department declare Russia to be a supporter of state terrorism. So um, I think that I think it should be okay. Um, you know, we, we know always that the problem countries are always going to be, I think, more France and Germany. Um, and um, Schultz has been is a very weak leader and if, and um, and Merkel has gone. Uh, in um, in uh, France, Macron is um, the only really pro-European uh, or pro-Ukrainian leader in France because the other political leaders in France tend to be pro-Russian. So in some ways, France is the most complicated because there are more pro-Russianists on the left and on the center right and the far right. Whereas in Germany, it's, it's more difficult. I mean, the, the most anti, the biggest anti-Putin party in Germany are the Greens, ironically. Yeah, very uh, strange because, you know, the, there's a joke that it's yes. like a watermelon. When you slice it, uh, the Greens, you find reds inside. So, <laughs> well, so. They, 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 for them, it's, a quite, it's more a question of human rights. I think, you know, mm -hmm. it's the whole issue of human rights, that human rights should be a priority over economics and money, money making. So they are kind of quite idealistic left wingers in that sense. They. Whereas the social democrats are kind of, of are, are economic prostitutes, they have sold themselves out to business, big business, like like Schroeder, for example. So I think it's different. So I, I think that 
Winter will be very difficult for Ukrainian civilians. I think they will get support, but you know, quite a few civilians in Ukraine have been have their properties been destroyed. But the biggest problem for the winter will be Russian soldiers. I mean, their logistic problems have been a problem since the since the beginning of the invasion. And those Russian soldiers are going to freeze during winter. They are going to freeze. And and the problem that they have is that if they are so so cold at night they keep their trucks running their engines running what this means is that they have become easy targets for drones absolutely absolutely <laughs> so we, we, we I, heard I, that so you know I, there is a problem with the russian tanks for example that the german tanks they have a separate smaller you know engine to keep the heating you know but uh, in, in russian tanks you have to keep the main engine you know uh, just to keep the heating on you know or air conditioning so, <laughs> so in russian be... tanks you just have to wave your arms about all the time <laughs> so you are you are quite optimistic yeah as i understand and you uh, think that uh, the unity of western world uh, will will sort the things out i think for this year this year we can't say what happens next year but for this year i still think that the majority of people in western governments and in nato and the eu have come to believe that this crisis is ex existential for the west that Ukraine, we cannot allow Ukraine to be defeated. So I, I think, you know, if there are three scenarios, Ukraine defeated, Russia just very weakened, or Russia defeated, then the West only is looking at the last two, not Ukraine defeated, but Putin very weakened and Russia defeated. Those are the only two options, scenarios the West is thinking about. But don't, don't you don't that, you think that this scenario scares uh, Germany and and France uh, of Putin defeated because we hear you know that you know the nuclear weapons would be out of you know control sure, and uh, sure, but what sure, is in control sure. now I mean <laughs> it's well, quite well I mean you know and, and and we don't know if 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 the whole Russian military is in such a bad condition and what condition is the nuclear weapons in um, we simply don't know I mean Putin likes to keep using the threat of nuclear weapons all the time. Um, but so we don't know um, what what at what level he will become this. But I think that you know let's let's be cynical here a bit as well because um, there must be many people in the United States and NATO who are very happy to see Russia's military being destroyed in such a way. I mean, there's nearly a thousand Russian officers have been killed. You know, 80,000 troops, 1,000 officers. I mean, most of Russia's tanks, or 70% or so, have been very severe. 60, 70% have been destroyed. The Black Sea Fleet has been attacked. For NATO, there must be people who cannot say publicly this, but privately, they must be saying, this is great. Because the more Ukraine destroys the Russian forces, the less chance they will ever try to do something with NATO. So you don't think that uh, the U.S. is looking at this and thinking if the Russia collapses, uh, then China enlarges its territory or gets resources and we will have a bigger problem in China? So you think there could be a Chinese-Polish border, right? <laughs> like we joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good joke. Uh, yeah, yeah. um, I, I, you know, um, one of the things that's come out of this invasion is that Russia is now the younger brother of the Chinese. So we've gone back to the 14th century where, where Muscovy was a younger brother of the Mongols. Um, so uh, the Russia is, uh, Russia, the Chinese always had a kind of a very racist view towards the Russians. And now they really, really look down on, on Russia as a state because China is a rising power. Russia is a declining power and Russia has been unable to show that it has strong military force and and being unable to deal with the with the, with a with a country like ukraine so i what's happened is that the chinese have kind of have, have come to view russia have come to view putin as basically a very corrupt mafia state but but uh, but Taras, it, is is that really good for let's say united states of america because for them a weak russia but still russia might be a less problem uh, you know, compared to enlarged and, uh, you know, China, which has more resources, you know, and land and uh, 
and so on? Well, I don't think the West has a choice. I mean, you know, the West didn't start this war. I mean, but um, so if, if the end result is a weakened Russia or a Russia without Putin, then, then maybe that's better. I mean, I mean, the the optimistic scenario would be that Putin is removed because remember, there is no honor amongst thieves. So, so all of these guys around Putin are crooks um, and they don't have a loyalty to Putin. It's loyalty to this corruption. This, they're all involved together. Um, the, the optimistic scenario would be Putin would be replaced by um, a more, shall we say, pragmatic nationalist who can blame Putin for the war and, and understands that Russia needs to remove these sanctions so that the economy won't collapse. I mean, there, we haven't talked about it, but the, but the predictions for the Russian economy from September onwards are disastrous. Um, but you know, there, there, there were predictions that the, the Russian economy uh, will collapse, but uh, it didn't. They no. found, found ways to, to India no, and China. No, no. no, most experts always said that um, sanctions take a long time to have an impact. Um, and we are seeing, seeing the beginning of that now. And proper, you know, real experts talk about the problems of sanctions having an impact from, from September, after the summer Dacha season, shall we say. Um, and um, and you already see this, for example, with um, Russian airlines having to cut the number of flights. They they're using spare parts from different planes. So um, I mean, this is going to be a factor um, in in Russia, and it, there will be a uh, the, one of the biggest areas will be the whole question of energy. If the if Western Europe can survive this transition to a period when they no longer use Russian gas then where is Russia going to sell this gas? You can well, sell the answer, oil. The answer is India and China, maybe. No, 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 no. You can, you can sell oil, which is no, no longer sold to Europe, by putting it on ships and sending it to China. You cannot do this with the gas. To do this with gas, you need to convert the gas sent to Europe into LNG, liquid, liquid naturalized gas. Russia doesn't have that capability. Um, it hasn't built those capabilities. Um, to, to convert that. If you converted that gas to LNG, you could put it on ships and send it, but Russia hasn't done that. So um, if we remember that uh, Russian gas exports account for 40% of the Russian budget, if that money doesn't come in, where's Russian... We have to remember what kind of economy Russia is. Russia is Nigeria with nuclear weapons. Um, it, it has... It, it sells three things to the outside world. Gas, oil, and, and weapons. It's going to lose its gas sales to Europe. It's already lost the oil sales by the end of this year. And weapons, nobody wants to buy Russian weapons anymore. They have proven to be useless in Ukraine. Um, Philippines and India have already canceled the weapons contracts. Um, the biggest uh, benefactor, uh, beneficiary of this war is going to be Turkey. <laughs> They're going to be selling drones everywhere. <laughs> yeah, the um, Bayraktar for sure came uh, yes. as you know a, a word who which wants is... Russian weapons now. Who wants Russian weapons? They are shit. They're really crap weapons. Um, so um, I, I think Putin, as always, has scored a home goal, and you know he scored a goal in his own net. Um, this is going to be disastrous for for the Russian economy and for um, for for the Russian people, of course. Um, but then they should rebel against Putin. Okay, Tara. So I am pretty sure that uh, we're going to try to catch you uh, again and expand on these topics because uh, obviously, you know, you are an expert on, on, on this uh, area of, of the world. I mean, Ukraine and, uh, and the surrounding uh, areas. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank uh, you. It, it's, it's a pleasure. And... and um... Let's maybe see you later next month. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Taras is coming to Lithuania, where the podcast is based. So we're definitely going to try to catch him in person and uh, do a round two. Uh, let's call it like that. So in a craft beer bar. 
<laughs> oh yes, yes, oh, of course. But we cannot mention this because you know in Lithuania you cannot mention alcohol because in some kind of adver advertisement. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna right. non-alcoholic beverage. We're gonna have. Uh, let, of let's course, we're going to drink mineral water in the bar. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So every everyone who is who is who who is watching, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I just want to shout out that we have a supercast uh, platform from yesterday. So if you like our shows, you can always uh, uh, do a monthly donation or, or a single time donation. And we are very happy with that because uh, that keeps us going. So uh, thanks a lot and uh, see you in the next Let's Talk Europe episode.